This is the smallest endless loop tape cartridge ever made, introduced in 1986, manufactured by Bandai in Japan. In the US, this appeared in two novelty items, one of which was this Elvis in concert doll, which, honestly, without the outfit and the word Elvis written on it, I would have struggled to recognise who that was supposed to be from just looking at the face. But this 20-inch tall figure reproduced Hound Dog using one of these mini cartridges that slotted in the player in the base. On the back of the box, it mentions an additional 15 cartridges available for this one, four sets of three. But as you can see from the collection of carts that I have here, none of these are sung by Elvis. And that's because I've got the other device that was known to use this cartridge system, again sold in the US, no doubt on TV shopping channels. This is the Wurlitzer Micro Cassette Jukebox. Although, to be factual, it doesn't use the format known as Micro Cassette, and it's not made by Wurlitzer. And I'm not sure you could even really call it a jukebox but it does resemble one the classic Wurlitzer 1015 which was introduced in 1946 so this would have been out on its 40th anniversary and just think another three years on from now it'll be the 40th anniversary of this novelty jukebox perhaps they'll make a commemorative one i've got to thank joseph who got hold of all these things a few years ago for me in the us i don't think they've ever sold them over here but back in 2018 i did feature another tiny music cartridge format the pocket rockers and that one came out a year or so after the bandai cart and whilst it is quite similar it's definitely not the same the Bandai car only contains one song, the Pocket Rockers held two that ran parallel on separate tracks that you switch between. As you can see, it's also larger than the Bandai car and also not quite as sophisticated. The Bandai system used a foil splice which marked the end of the loop, which meant that the playback would automatically stop once the tape had been played through. The same system of a foil splice is used in an 8-track cart to indicate the end of a loop and automatically move the head down to the next program. In addition to the foil, the Bandai car also has a more sophisticated spring-loaded pinch roller, whereas the one in the pocket rockers is fixed in place. Now, I've got a feeling that these carts must have been used in some other devices in Japan. It seems like too much effort to go to to make up a whole new format just for a plastic jukebox and a dodgy-looking Elvis doll. Now, when you pick this thing up, you're pretty disappointed. It's plastic and thin tin. It looks better than it feels. It's definitely a cheap novelty. I'd imagine this thing would have looked quite good when they first advertised it with the right lighting, but once you get hold of one, you realise it is just a cheap novelty. It does have a coin slot on the front here. I don't think you'd want to give this to kids to play around with. It's more of a nostalgia thing for older people. In my coin slot, though, there are no coins, just some more cartridges. Although these cartridges that are included with the jukebox, there are some here that I haven't got with the other one. There's a total of three new titles, bringing the total of original songs between the two sets to 11. Let's try playing with the device. It's powered by four D cells. Playback starts immediately when a cart is inserted and the little record rotates in the window, which I think is a nice touch, although the volume is very low, which made me hunt around for a way to try and increase this. But it turns out there isn't one. In fact, there are no controls on the device at all. It's just an automatic player. Once you stick the cart in, it plays. When the tape reaches the foil splice at the end, it stops. After looking a little bit closer at the coin path, it appears that there is some kind of mechanism in there. So it looks like it should start the tape playing when a coin is inserted. But that feature is definitely not working on my machine. It's a bit odd though that it tells you to take the tape out whenever it's not in use because it's going to use the batteries otherwise. Which means that when you put that cartridge back in it's going to start the playback immediately, meaning that the coin slot is a little bit redundant. However, I'm finding that the majority of my tapes just don't want to play anyway. There's really only a few amongst these that will play reliably, and the ones that do, most of them, they play at too low a volume. Some seem fine though, which is a little bit strange. On the plus side, if we dim the room lights down, you can see that there is a bit of a light show going on here, which is something that I appreciate. But I think it's time to take a look inside this and see if any of the issues that I'm experiencing are things that can be easily fixed. 
I'm going to start off by looking at the coin mechanism. And yes, there is a plastic hammer here that is supposed to momentarily touch together two metal leaves whenever a coin passes over it. A bit of fishing around inside and I discovered that there was a loose grey wire that should have been connected up to one of those pieces of metal. And then I also found another loose grey wire. And sure enough, when those two are touched together, the tape mechanism starts up. So it turns out it's just a matter of soldering those wires to either piece of metal and then the coin operated playback should work again as originally intended. But before I get my soldering iron out, I just wanted to see if there was a volume pot somewhere on the circuit board. I did find a pot, but turning it only affected the playback speed. To resolve the volume issue, a capacitor swap out would be a good place to start. But with 13 capacitors on the board, it seems like a lot of time and trouble to go to for a plastic novelty with only a couple of working cartridges. For the moment, I'm just going to put that circuit board back in place and move on to sorting out the coin slot switch. Now, the fact that both of these wires had fallen off dry solder joints tells me that there wasn't really a great deal of care and attention that went into putting this thing together. I've got no idea what these originally sold for, but clearly they were made for as little as possible. However, with those wires back in place, the coin mechanism could be tried again, and it's now back to working as it was when this thing was new. I can't say the same for the tape cartridges though. I suspect that the ones that now play at an acceptable volume were a little bit too loud perhaps when they were new and the ones that now play at a whisper originally played at a more sensible volume. I decided though to have a look at the mechanism and see why some carts will play just fine while others can't seem to get past the foil section. When a cart is inserted, it presses in a micro switch at the rear left of the image here, with the red wires coming out of it. That's what starts the motor. However, when the foil bridges a connection between the tape head and the probe with the orange wire coming out of it, the motor power is cut. Now, I should mention that for a change, the belt in here is just fine. The problem with the playback of some of these cartridges clearly lies with the cartridges themselves and not the player. Unfortunately, the tape in this one was all bound up inside the cart, so we might as well take a look at what's gone wrong with it. Now, there are three visible screws in the top of the cartridge, and then there's another one that's hidden beneath the label. It's the usual endless loop tape cartridge system where the tape gets pulled out of the centre of the reel, pulled across the front of the cartridge by the pinch roller and capstan, and then the tape gets deposited back on the outside of the spool again. Since this one's damaged, I'm going to use it to do an experiment, though, to determine if the tape is running at the same speed as a regular cassette. I think it will, but let's find out. Now, I intended to spool the tape into a normal cassette shell, but I've misplaced my tape splicing kit, so I'm going to have to make do with what I've got here. It doesn't have to be perfect. It's only going to be played the once, and that chewed up section of tape isn't going to sound good again. When I came to pulling the tape off that spool, it's clear why the cartridge wasn't playing. It was on there so tight that there was no way the mechanism in the mini jukebox would ever get enough purchase on the tape to be able to pull it out of there. Nevertheless, with the tape re-spooled into a cassette shell, it's time to try and play it on a regular machine. Well, it was a 50-50 chance and I got it on the wrong side. It's playing backwards, so let's flip it over and have a listen to the other side. OK, so it's regular cassette tape. It's the same width, it's run at the same speed, and I think that might explain why some of these tapes are bound up. It's too similar. Let me explain. An 8-track car uses quarter-inch tape, but it's not the same quarter-inch tape you get on a regular reel. It's carbon-backed, and that's to ensure that the tape can easily slip over itself. It won't stick together. I suspect that they used regular off-the-shelf cassette tape in the Bandai carts. And whilst it will have worked initially, getting on for 40 years later, it's gone and got itself stuck together. If the squeal of the tape is anything to go by when I run my fingers over it, compared against an 8-track tape, this theory might hold some water. But I think this is where I should call it a day. I'm going to put the jukebox back together again, and perhaps one day somebody somewhere might want to do a recap on this particular device. But with so many other things for me to spend my time on, this one isn't a priority right now, especially when so many of the cartridges for it seem to have got themselves stuck together.
But despite all the issues, I've still managed to achieve what I set out to do here. That was to show you the world's smallest endless loop tape cartridge system. We've had a look at the player. We've had a look at the cartridges. We've even heard some very brief snippets of audio from them. So there's not much else I could have done, even if this thing was working perfectly. So I think that's it for the moment. As always, thanks for watching.